Hey everybody, it's Jane Johnston with the Briar Hill Groups at Remax Camosun, a host of Vancouver Island Time and Community Talks. I'm here with Lori Frank of Lori Frank Mediation and Consulting, Laurel Dietz of Alinea Legal Coaching, and Bettina Plendel from Financial Divorce Strategies. Oh, Bettina Plendel Financial Divorce Strategies. How are you guys doing today? Pretty well. Pretty good. 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 Thank you. Yes. How about you? I'm doing well, having a little glitch with my technology. So I'm on plan B. I'm on um, a wee laptop. <laughs> sitting on, a wee laptop sitting on four cookbooks. So uh, <laughs> okay. I'm human, right? Sure. Yeah. And it works. And it works. I, I think that's the whole COVID thing, right? We figure out that things work. You just make them work. Exactly. It's a different procedure sometimes, but it works. Yeah. Um, yeah, including, um, I don't know if you saw the video today of my daughter doing my hair, but um, that's something that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see that. <laughs> it's pretty funny. She was having fun. Anyway, it's okay. Okay, so um, just wondering what everybody, um, what's happening with your with your businesses. So actually, how about uh, we start with you, Laurel? Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, this is a this is a, a, an interesting question for me. Um, so nothing is happening. I mean, my business is running as it did before, um, remotely. But um, I realized I've gotten to a point now where I need to meet with clients uh, to sign their agreements or swear their affidavits. And uh, I realized that my office space is much too small to accommodate that. So that's I wanted to wanted to discuss with everyone what what are they putting in place to protect their clients. And so um, I ran a little poll on my Instagram and um, mm. I got one respondent. <laughs> and I asked, Would you prefer to meet your lawyer outside to sign important documents? So I guess the, the you know, you have to think, okay, do I really want my neighbors watching me sign this separation agreement or whatever? Like, do I value my privacy or do I value my health? Anyway, my one respondent had put 100%, yes, I want to meet people, I want to meet my lawyer outside. And I, you know, as the lawyer, I would prefer to meet my clients outside. I feel safer that way. Um, especially given my current office space, but we're considering in the fall uh, moving um, our lease is up and the space was a bit too small in any event. Mm. And I was just trying to think about what am I looking at for future office space? What do I want to have in place? Um, is it going to be an office space where everybody comes into work every day or do we stay working remotely and only meet our clients as needed, but mostly pushing mm -hmm. to have video conference meetings. Um, so these are like discussions that I'm gonna be having with my um, my team at uh, Linear Legal Coaching and kind of, cause I wanna see how they feel as well. Cause they, you know, they're affected, their families are affected and they need to be able to feel safe coming into work. And yet we still need to be able to provide our clients with that security and privacy that they might want. Um, Great question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, it's it's a it's a process question, really, right? Yeah. So, so. I I mean, uh, so we have the same thing. Real estate's interesting because uh, we do most of our transactions at people's homes, or we've moved more to online, and we do um, all of our coaching sort of with our clients via telephone now. Yeah. So I don't know. It's I mean it works. It's, I would find there's less intimacy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? Like, is this the way it's going to be then until we have a vaccine, or is this like? I mean, I, I kind of don't see even with lifting or loosening of restrictions, I don't see how things can even change that much uh, mm -hmm. for some of these businesses. And I'd be interested to hear what Lori and Bettina have to say about their businesses. What do you mm -hmm. What do you think, Lori? Um, well, so far I'm continuing online. Um, when I'm needing people to sign things, I'm sending it out through uh, getting them signed digitally. So mm -hmm. agreements to participate in mediation and that kind of thing. Um, for me, because I'm not creating a legal document, they don't sign their final document with me. So that's kind of out of, I don't need to worry about that piece of things, but there are some documents they sign before they get going with me. 
Um, so I'm doing those over DocuSign. Um, but thinking about, you know, as things may relax over the summer and so on, um, I don't keep a full-time office. So I uh, book space as I need it. And I've got a few different places in Victoria or the West Shore or Duncan or different places, depending on where I'm mediating, that I'll book. So for me, it's going to be a big consideration if I am doing something in person of what that space is like. Um, so some spaces I've used in the past, I already know will be too small. Boardrooms that I know uh, aren't going to be too small. Or, um, whereas there's some co-working spaces that I've used in the past where I can rent as needed. And they have some bigger rooms. And so I can envision um, being able to meet with a couple, for example, if it's a bigger room, we, and then of course providing all the hygiene protocols and all of that kind of thing. So I'm starting to think about it, but I'm still unsure exactly. So far people are okay with it online um, for private mediations. It's more the, um, some of the government stuff that uh, is sometimes hard to get online. And those ones I'm trying to think about how and when uh, will we try to have small group meetings in really big rooms? <laughs> right. So, yeah. So I'm not sure. It even that really takes out the intimacy of not being able to sit around a a normal sized table with each other. It's a little. I'm envisioning it as being a little awkward sitting at in a large room with a small group of people. But yeah. Yeah, and it's an emotional moment, right? So people have a soft voice eventually, or they just drop, and then you can't hear, and then it's, uh, I, I think there might be some really awkward situations. As I, I'm hard of hearing. I'm wearing two hearing aids, um, and if I take them out, mm. I'm close to being deaf. So I can feel, uh, I know before I, I figured out I have that massive hearing loss, um, that I asked, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand. Oh, can you repeat that it makes people really angry and it, it changes the dynamics of a conversation. If someone speaks up, as especially women, we, we get a higher pitch voice and some have just the feeling you're getting yelled at. So, I mean, I can just tune up my hearing aids. Um, so that's not the good news, but I feel with people who might have a, a, a mild hearing loss or something, uh, working with specific situations where you're just like, sorry, um, I guess. And then we have the privacy issue, right? Now you speak up and sometimes buildings are really built with paper thin walls. So if someone wants to hear something, they actually can hear it now. And I think, um, I just hope um, everything goes back to normal. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as for me, if it comes to me, I decided I, I won't have one-on-one um, -on -one meetings if I can avoid it. I work remotely with most of my clients. I don't have any documentation signed. And if then it's a digital signature, I'm happy with that. Um, I work PC wide, so most of my meetings are even sometimes only on the phone due to privacy the, the other side wants to have, um, or on Zoom, like we meet, and I'm getting really, and I'm used to it a lot, being on Zoom. And moving forward with local people, I decided, because I have someone in my household I need to be sensitive about, um, I just go there, do what I can, and just have what everybody else does if they work right now drop the clothes at the door and getting sanitized, probably take a deep dive in some hand sanitizer and <laughs> protect my loved ones from, from that and simply avoid uh, still consulting in person. I, I, mm -hmm. I think the safety, definitely the safety over the privacy. Mm -hmm. because if you don't have safety, you won't have privacy anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, but I think... Um, yeah. Also, people now can wear earbuds for privacy. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, online for sure. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so um, let's just, I want to go over today what you guys do, each of you do in this, uh, 
in a sort of team aspect of how we would work together, just because mm -hmm. I think that uh, we haven't done that in a while. So um, somebody comes up, usually they would come to me, I find, and they say, uh, you know, I'm not happy with my wife or my husband. What do I do? And then I would send them to either Laura, <laughs> Laurel or Lori. So uh, do you guys want to talk about what happens if somebody's unhappy in their current relationship? Uh, I don't mind if Lori, if you don't mind, I'll, I will tell them what I do. I, what I do is sure. I sit down usually for an initial session, which is a longer session. And we talk, and usually we're at a point not where they're unhappy in their current relationship. Usually they've decided to separate. <laughs> so the emotional piece is long done. <laughs> And we're getting down into, okay, what does this mean for me? Um, so I talk to them about their rights and responsibilities at law. And then we kind of dig down into what is it they want to see um, after, you know, what do they, what do they want their life to be like after they've separated? Um, and then we might come up with a few strategies of how to get from, from A to B. So A being completely still joined to your spouse that you're separated from. Um, and B being a signed separation agreement or a court order dividing up all the assets and setting out the parenting arrangements. Um, and then depending on kind of the family dynamic um, and the complexity of the financial information they might need to sort out, I would send them to mediation, uh, which is Lori, and she, she would might guide the two couples, the couple to, you know, to reach their agreement together, because I'm only advising one half um, and strategizing with one half. I'm an advocate, not a, or a lawyer, right? So I can't help both parties out. And then if I think that there's a complicated or more tricky financial situation, uh, or the couple is struggling to kind of figure out their family finances, and I would send them off to Bettina to work with them to um, figure out what are the family assets, what are the family debts, and what is how are they going to achieve their goals um, afterwards. And I've actually I've sent some clients to Bettina before when even if it's just one one half of a couple who just doesn't know, you know, they think I want to keep the family house and I want to do all these things and all that. And I only have this much income. And I think, okay, well, maybe you need to know what your life will look like after separation. And, and Bettina can help you with that um, projection or forecast. Um, right. Mm -hmm. So, and also um, sometimes I'm called in at that point and people are mm -hmm. asking me what the value of the house is. Absolutely. That's a very important component because that's usually their largest uh, family asset. So, um, you know, not everybody is interested in going and jumping and getting an appraisal. Sometimes it's more important to get a market assessment, which is what uh, Jane is a great connection for. And then obviously, if they want to sell the house, <laughs> which most most people should and do sell their house when they separate. So um, then they're off to off to Jane. <laughs> Yeah, and sometimes the house is perceived as being a territory of one or the other people. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they, it's an emotional thing. So that's why they decide to sell. Okay, so then they go to you, Lori. And what do you do? Yeah, well, um, if they're both uh, wanting to go through the mediation process, that's the big first step is that they're both on board for it. It can't just be one person wants to do it. Um, so as long as they're both on board, then what I do is uh, I got an intake that I do with them just to get some background info. Um, and then I meet with each of them individually to hear from their perspective what they're hoping for, what they're feeling like they need to discuss, what they're hoping for for outcomes, where their flexibility lies, where it does not, <laughs> all of those kinds of things. Um, same as Laurel, if um, I'm listening to their financial situation and it sounds um, like it's got more to it than just uh, a few assets and debts that seem pretty straightforward, then I'll send them to Bettina as well because um, I, I like that Bettina is able to sort of uh, run the pros and cons of all the different scenarios they could potentially be entertaining. Um, so then they can come back to me after that and they know okay if we do this this is what it looks like if we do make these financial choices this is what it looks like and so they can come to the table with that uh, much more knowledgeable um so yeah then we work through all of the information um if they have not already sought legal advice often it will come up 
during mediation, someone will say, well, what's my legal right here? Or they'll ask me a legal question. And I can point them towards, uh, you know, readily available resources online that where they could go and, you know, sort of read, here's typically what happens with parenting time or pensions or whatever it is. Uh, but, um, but sometimes that doesn't give them the answer they need specific to their situation. So I'll, I'll uh, recommend that, uh, well, only one of them can choose Laurel, but <laughs> I'll give them Laurel's name and a, a couple other names because uh, we'll need at least two people, <laughs> two lawyers involved if they each have some questions. Um, so that as we're moving through mediation, they've got that legal advice in the background. Uh, or sometimes right at the table. Uh, some people prefer to bring their lawyers to the table and then we're all there together working through things and they've got that person right there to ask questions. Um, yeah, and then of course, as you mentioned, Jane, uh, the house is always, uh, is very often the biggest asset more times than not. And so uh, you, I would recommend that they get in touch with someone like you to have their house assessed or, or if they're using a, an appraiser, then they might be just looking for a realtor because they've made that decision to sell the home. I'll, so, and I'll talk yeah. about the differences between them because most people don't know. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, Bettina, what about you? You, again, like Lori, you're uh, helping both sides at the same time, right? Correct. I can work with both. And sometimes I have people who find me first as they want to do the kitchen table uh, separation. There's certain uh, resources online. And then they're stuck with the finances because they find there's, um, I don't know, a pension plan or someone is self-employed, which is very common on the island. And then always it's, it's um, not always, but Quite often, it's it's frankly intertwined as a legal with a legal legality. So I need to refer them to a lawyer. I can't give legal advice. So here comes Laurel into play. And um, <laughs> many of my clients they don't want to do a, a real collaborative uh, work, which would be two lawyers, two divorce coaches, maybe a child specialist, and a financial neutral, as it easily adds up what the hour costs. And they are. I basically really figured their stuff out. They just need help on a few aspects, on a legal point of view, on a financial point of view. And I would recommend them talking with Laurie as Laurie um, can help them, you know, bypassing those obstacles and in a respectful way. And certainly the family home is, is often a debate. And yes, if someone is emotionally attached, the question would be, can you afford it? And then if the numbers say no, um, as my perspective is as well, I need to find out if someone can easily retire. And if you have to pay out your spouse and take out a new mortgage in your, in your late 50s, mid 50s, um, that might be a true challenge to retire ever because you have high monthly payment. And if you'd rather, sell, if you say, well, I'd rather sell the house than then, then we don't know what the uh, what the future holds, right? So it's always a risk. Real estate is a type of uh, investment which is um, not liquid, uh, but you can sell it and then you have to wait and see what's happening. And you might hit the market at the moment, that's not perfect, but you know, it offers you an ability, uh, a possibility to move on and start a true new chapter in life. So I'm often in favor of um, changing location. Right. Yeah, emotionally. I mean, my mom lived in our house for 20 years. And then when uh, my parents, had, after they split, then when she divorced finally after 20 years, um, after legal separation, it just brought everything to head again. I really don't recommend it. <laughs> it's not fun. So yes, yes. the whole family went through it again. I mean, just move on, move on. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's hard. It yeah. is hard. It's a very, going through a separation divorce can be like an exercise in being very yeah. zen about things and just learning to let go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't need possessions. <laughs> you don't need things. Well, yeah. I don't know if you guys know, but I was married for seven months one year. <laughs> I heard a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, well, we were together for five years, but then, um, you know, 
it was just a uh, different values. And I just thought, okay, I just know it's not going to work. So m mostly it was about um, respect and, and money. So, um, yeah. and, um, and I wasn't even making a lot of money, but I was like, you, you know, you can take whatever you want. As I'm, yeah. I'm fine to just move on. It made, it made life easy and things were more important to that person than me. So mm -hmm. we had the things and I had the life. So that's how I ended up at West. Yay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, happy to have you. And I wanted to mention because you say out West in BC, it doesn't correct me, Laurel, if I'm wrong. Um, we always talk marriage and divorce and separation, but there's plenty of unmarried couples who live common law and they actually have the same problems or uh, to solve as officially married couples. So we should not, we should mention that too, right? That this process is for marriage and if you're cohabiting, it's. it's yeah, if you've been living mm -hmm. with someone for two years in a marriage like relationship is the term, um, then you may as well be married. <laughs> There's yeah. no difference. In, in BC, really. right? Right. There's other provinces who look at that situation completely differently, I think. And it's not as favorable as in BC. So mm -hmm. is the division of assets 50-50 under the law? Uh, the basic principle is any asset that you have acquired or any debt or any pension that you acquired during the relationship. So that's the date you started living together, not the date you became common law. The date you started living together to the date that you separate. Anything that exists at the date of separation is divisible 50-50. So you're kind of looking at, yeah, you look at the date you started living with someone, to the date you separate, what exists on the date you separate. Was it acquired during that time, if it was? Then it doesn't matter whose name it is, it's in, it's divisible 50 50. And if you don't like that, <laughs> you don't like that idea, then get a cohabitation agreement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah there's, other, there's exceptions, right? There's always excluded property and all sorts of things. But for the most part, it's going to be divisible 50 50. Okay. And, and if they don't want to divide it 50 50, um, because they've had some sort of pre agreement, because I know some people who do that. Yeah. Um, then, and even if it's not in writing, but they honor it, it's not, it doesn't, they can still divide it up whatever way they want. Yeah. As long as you stay in the agreement, the negotiation mediation phase, then yeah, you can do whatever you want. It's the minute you draw, drag yourself into court and are fighting tooth and nail that the judge is going to have to weigh in and they're going to apply what the law is. And that's going to be the 50, 50. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's so, what most what most people don't understand that um, it's it's your separation, right? If if as long as you don't pull it into public and to court, you're basically as long as you agree and both sign, um, you can do the split whatever you feel like it. There's a million ways to cut a cake, and you don't have to split everything really fifty fifty. The value should. 50 but that's what i can do because often people destroy equity or they don't consider tax liabilities mm -hmm. and consequences so it it um i mean it's never a win-win but it doesn't have to be a massive loss that's what right. i'm saying along those so, same oh go go ahead i was gonna say along those same lines um when people well i mean i always recommend it but especially when people have made agreements that aren't sort of the typical agreements where they have decided to divide things where on paper it's maybe not looking exactly 50-50 or you know one person's decided that's not important to me and so things you know just those kinds of agreements that maybe aren't typical regardless i always recommend independent legal advice at the end of an agreement uh, a mediated agreement because um it covers both your risk for both of you, and especially in those ones where you've made maybe more unique agreements, um, so that later uh, should either one of you go, well, maybe I changed my mind, or uh, I wasn't sure what I was uh, signing, or somebody looks and goes, what, you gave up all that? Or, you know, and that was what they agreed to at the time, and over lots of discussion, but uh, I always tell them to go get the independent legal advice so that someone else has looked at that before they sign it and said, here's your risks with what you've decided here. Um, 
so that, you know, it just protects both people down the road. So that's another point at which I refer people out to Laurel to uh, have someone look at their agreement before they sign. Just on that point, Lori, I wanted to ask Jane in a second about the market, but um, it's always useful if people get their a little bit of advice before they go into mediation and then again on the mm -hmm. agreement they come out. Because by the time they've negotiated yeah. that agreement, a lot has been yes. kind of <laughs> settled and it's hard to draw back from that agreement, even if it's not legally binding. It's 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 hard to put yourself in a good negotiating position again. So you want to know, yeah. have a clear plan, I think, or idea or know what you're going for in mediation, I think, while still keeping an open mind. Yeah, totally. I agree. Especially when I'm when I'm having those initial conversations with people, I can hear the points of, of different issues where I can tell they need more information on something. And so I will send them out before they come back then for that joint session because it's exactly right. You're exactly right. You get so invested and it takes so much time to get to that final agreement and then to go, oh, oh, maybe I, I don't want that. <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> Sounds like buying a house. We thought our own house. <laughs> so um, I can talk a bit about real estate. I'm going to be looking at my other computer because um, this one froze earlier. So uh, we're a bit low on sales still. Uh, last year in May, we had 848 sales in the whole month, which is a great month. And um, normally we're like around 600. And right now we're at 124 unconditional sales so far this month. So that says to me, um, when we're a third of the way in, we're going to be we're going to be down probably about 50% in sales, which is where we were last month. And in terms of new listings, we have 287. That's quite good. And we're, um, last year we had 1613 for the month of May. And we, in terms of active listings, we have 2,319. So we're still below. So last year we, we tend to build in April and May, but I think what we're, what we're going to see is the market is being pushed. So everybody has been on hold for two months and I think the market will be on hold. And what's happening to, for me personally in the business is I'm finding a lot of people are starting to phone um like literally this week and last week there the phone started to ring and so i'm just answering questions starting to get people ready i've got a home inspection tomorrow i'm doing a market analysis tomorrow um talking to other people about potentially listing uh the thing that people need to realize is when they list their house when they talk to a realtor um, and this came out today, is the person I was speaking with just wants you to know the price. What's the price of the house? That always makes me nervous because there's two aspects uh, when you sell a house. One is price, and that's important. And the other one is the um, marketing. And the marketing changes and the negotiation skills of the realtor change what you get. And how do I know this? Um, so I listed a property a couple of weeks ago. We got an accepted offer in two days. The realtor came in. He's like, well, the market and condos down 10%. You know, he's spouting all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, well, we listed it lower than we were going to list it. And we're not coming down anymore. And we got what the client wanted for the house. So uh, having a strong negotiator is important. And um, as one of my clients said, I'm a wolf in sheep's clothing. So <laughs> if you want to <laughs> think it. Okay. And I just also want to explain that terminology. So when you have a realtor come in, they do a market analysis. Right. And what we're doing is we're looking at where the market's been, what's currently for sale, and where we perceive the market's going. And this is different than how anybody else is looking at it. Uh, bank is doing an appraisal the benefit of the appraisal is for the bank or if um, somebody's getting an appraisal for a divorce the benefit of the appraisal is for the person who is getting the who's paying for the appraisal so they are looking at what's sold they do not look at market conditions 
They just, it's just completely financial. And so if you're going from a slow market into a fast market, they can undervalue. If you're going from a fast market into a slow market, they can overvalue. So they're going to follow what the market's doing. And then the third thing is your tax assessment. So that is the purpose of that assessment is to ascertain what the taxes are for the city municipality that you live in. And they then look at, creating a mill rate and through that mill rate, they then determine how they're going to get their taxes uh, to pay for uh, what, whatever is worth. So you can live in a place and your taxes may not go over, um, you know, $3,000 over five years, but your actual value of your house may change. And they, and so your tax rate may go down as the value goes up. It all depends on what the city is, is looking at and the um, the tax assessment is done by BC assessment here in Victoria and they don't go and see your house. They don't know if you've renovated it. All they do is they look at what the averages of the houses in your area. They plug it into comparables and then out comes a number. So 50% of the time it's high and 50% of the time it's low. So that's not, that's not a good thing to to look at for determining what your value is. It is also looking at what's sold in your area between April and uh, the end of September, the year before. So it's always six months out of date. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's really an interesting, I'm glad you did that, Jane, kind of comparing those three different numbers, because people are often using those to value their home in their um, agreement. So I think, you know, sometimes we look at the BC assessment to kind of get like just a ballpark, like knowing that it's going to be hopefully low, because um, um, lower than what your actual value of your home is. Um, but just to get an idea of what we're looking at as far as assets. Um, and often I'll say, okay, if you want to go to court, you need to you need to have an appraisal. Um, but I think that my recommendation to my clients will likely be to do an appraisal and also a market analysis and compare the two numbers um, to decide on how you want to negotiate that um, that price if you're trying to buy out your your spouse's interest. And you, what you want to mm -hmm. ask is, what's the list price and what is the anticipated sale price? Mm. Uh, yeah. Because um, sometimes it like again, it depends on the realtor and their strategy. Mm -hmm. So I'll always try and sell or list where it's going to sell, because that way you're going to reach the market that the maximum market value. So like if some, but if something is worth like nine thirteen, I'll list it at eight ninety nine because people who often look up to 900 can spend, you know, $10,000 more and anybody looking over 900,000 will think that this is a good deal and they'll offer and you can generate multiple offers, but it all depends on the strategy. And of course we take that into consideration when we're talking with people. Yeah. I wanted to mention that I experienced as well that people have an emotional value for their home or they poured 50000 into a renovation, which was completely useless for the purpose of selling the house for a higher price, right? They just didn't watch HGTV or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> or didn't talk to a specialist like a realtor who says, well, if you do that, then I could sell it for maybe 10 grand more. So you don't even then don't spend the 50. So, um, so and, and I, what I found a realtor really gives you that idea what is it worth? What would a family pay to move into your house in that specific neighborhood? Because that is something which is important to, is there a great school nearby or whatever, you know, is it close to an area where people just don't move in? There's a lid on the neighborhood, right? Of, I don't know, 800,000. I'm an Animo girl. So to me, 800,000 is a lot of house. Well, that'll <laughs> buy you a really crappy house in downtown Victoria. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and on the the bridge, west shore, it'll buy you a nice house hmm? what's that on the west shore it'll get you a nice house and then okay. in in um it'll also get you a nice house in the Saanich peninsula in an in a neighborhood 
Um, it would be interesting actually one week to take a house at this price and mm. what you can Plunk get it down in different places yeah. next week. <laughs> yeah. And I think that is simply something an appraisal might not take as much into consideration and for sure not BC assessment, correct? Well, they look at all the same data. We all look at the same data and they all get their data from us. Our, uh, appraisers look at they have exactly the same data but they're looking at what's sold mm -hmm. and they have a formula that they go through and um you know i've been in a house where an appraiser said well i see you know is is this house really worth this and i'm like we had five offers so whenever an appraiser calls me about what the house is worth when it's my listing i tell them how much activity we've had yeah okay Okay. Any other yeah. questions? Oh, that's it for me. That's very informative. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, great yeah, meeting, thanks. actually. So yeah. Thank yeah. You. Yes, I learned more. Next week, I learned something from you, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's just put up um, your contact information. So if you guys want to get in touch with uh, these guys, Laurel is at legalcoach.ca. Bettina Plendle is at bpdivorcestrategies.ca. Uh, Lori Frank is lauriefrankmediation.com. And I'm at thebarryhillgroup.com. Stay tuned. Tomorrow we're going to have a fun um, day. We're going to be talking with uh, Carolyn Harris Duncan about makeup. So because <laughs> we all need a bit of a lift these days. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay so we'll see you next tuesday if you guys have any questions just get in touch with us and we're happy to help you through this process we know it's hard being a single parent or um, being in a tough relationship we're here to help you right guys that's right yep sounds great okay Thanks. and just for the record i had fun today <laughs> <laughs> okay bye you guys Thanks. bye, bye